Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the China Vintage Hour, brought to you by Teacup Media. Laszlo Montgomery here with more recollections from your favorite 19th century condescending imperialist, Mr. Robert Fortune. We're still in the 1840s, 1844 to be exact. Fortune will be heading back to Old Blighty the following year. I'm still reading from his first book, Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China. This was published in 1847. If you are at all interested in the subject of tea, this episode is going to offer you some degree of satisfaction. It's the subject of tea that propelled Robert Fortune to fame and fortune, no pun intended. His ticket to China was his expertise in the fields of botany and horticulture. These past few episodes, he's been traipsing around Hong Kong, Guangdong, Fujian, and Zhejiang, merely a year after the prying open of the treaty ports of Canton, Xiamen, Fuzhou, Shanghai, and Ningbo. He initially went to China at the expense of the London Horticultural Society, and all the while, as he's been going from one adventure to another, he's been sending back dozens of specimens of plants and insects. Today's narrative... Today's narrative offers up Fortune's observations and stories about tea, visiting the city of Suzhou, and sailing down the Mean River in Fujian to the mouth at Fuzhou. He begins this episode by telling all he knows about the subject of tea as a plant, how to grow it, the steps to process it, and how to turn it into an ingredient for use as a beverage. All this knowledge he picked up along the way, traveling through the tea countries of China. In Fortune's day, and indeed going back to the great Linnaeus himself in the century previous to Fortune, it was held that green tea and black tea came from two different species of the tea plant. Fortune became the first European to discover that, in fact, no matter green or black tea, the leaf is the same. It's all in the processing. And you'll get to hear Fortune's step-by-step -step descriptions of how the Chinese did that. And if you listen to the internationally award-winning 10-part History of Tea series from the CHP, you'll know that what Fortune observed took the Chinese a couple thousand years to figure out. If you're interested how the tea business was conducted in 19th century China, your chance is here. Fortune offers some insight into how they did it back then. You'll also see that RF discovers that Chinese merchants were adding a poisonous food color to the dried leaves to give it a nice bright green look that they figured the Euros and Americanskis both preferred. Fortune refers to this as a blooming color. He travels to Suzhou, the Venice of China, and gets to groove on the beauty of that fabled city, though he finds plenty to turn his nose up at. As in the past episodes, you'll notice as Fortune, either alone or with companions, improvises his way past each obstacle that he's up against. And you hear it straight from RF himself. Western people were not terribly popular with the old hundred surnames. Like Admiral Zheng He, who made those voyages during the Ming Dynasty Yongle Emperor's reign, Fortune sailed right past the Wuhu Man, or Five Tiger Gate, that stands near the entrance to the Mean River in Fuzhou. One thing about Fortune, he's not shy about letting it all hang out as far as uh, what he felt about the people of Fujian. He's not a fan. He states that the population of Fuzhou and the surrounding areas at that time was about half a million. Today, Fuzhou has about seven million souls who call the place home. Anyway, we're getting close to the end of Fortune's debut visit to China. Let's continue on with his observations in China from over 170 years ago. There are a few subjects connected with the vegetable kingdom which have attracted such a large share of public notice as the tea plant of China. Its cultivation on the Chinese hills, the particular species or variety which produces the black and green teas of commerce, and the method of preparing the leaves have always been objects of peculiar interest. The jealousy of the Chinese government in former times prevented foreigners from visiting any of the districts where tea is cultivated, and the information derived from the Chinese merchants, even scanty as it was, was not to be depended upon. 
And hence we find our English authors contradicting each other, some asserting that black and green teas are produced by the same variety and that the difference in color is the result of a different mode of preparation, while others say that the black teas are produced from the plant called by botanists Tia Bohe and the green from Tia Veridis, both of which we have had for many years in our gardens in England. During my travels in China since the last war, I have had frequent opportunities of inspecting some extensive tea districts in the black and green tea countries of Canton, Fujian, and Zhejiang, and the result of these observations is now laid before the reader. It will prove that even those who have had the best means of judging have been deceived, and that the greater part of the black and green teas, which are brought yearly from China to Europe and America, are obtained from the same species or variety, namely from the Tia veridis. Dried specimens of this plant were prepared in the districts I have named by myself and are now in the herbarium of the Horticultural Society of London, so that there can be no longer any doubt upon the subject. In various parts of the Canton province, where I had an opportunity of seeing tea cultivated, the species proved to be the tea bohe, or what is commonly called the black tea plant. In the green tea districts of the north, I allude more particularly to the province of Zhejiang, I never met with a single plant of this species, which is so common in the fields and gardens near Canton. All the plants in the green tea country near Ningbo, on the islands of the Joshan Archipelago, and in every part of the province which I had an opportunity of visiting, proved, without exception, to be Tia veridis. 200 miles further to the northwest, in the province of Jiangnan, and only a short distance from the tea hills in that quarter, I also found in gardens the same species of tea. Thus far, my actual observation exactly verified the opinions I had formed on the subject before I left England, viz. that the black teas were prepared from the tea of Bohe and the green from tea of Eridus. When I left the north, on my way to the city of Fuzhou on the river Min in the province of Fujian, I had no doubt that I should find the tea hills there, covered with the other species, tea bohe, from which we generally suppose the black teas are made. And this was the more likely to be the case, as this species actually derives its specific name from the bohe hills in this province. Great was my surprise to find all the plants of the tea hills near Fuzhou exactly the same as those in the green tea districts of the north. Here were then green tea plantations on the black tea hills, and not a single plant of the tea bohe to be seen. Moreover, at the time of my visit, the natives were busily employed in the manufacture of black teas. Although the specific differences of the tea plants were well known to me, I was so much surprised, and I may add amused, at this discovery that I procured a set of specimens for the herbarium and also dug up a living plant, which I took northward to Zhejiang. On comparing it with those which grow on the green tea hills, no difference whatever was observed. It appears, therefore, that the black and green teas of the northern districts of China, those districts in which the greater part of the teas for the foreign markets are made, are both produced from the same variety, and that that variety is the tea of Eridus, or what is commonly called the green tea plant. On the other hand, those black and green teas which are manufactured in considerable quantities in the vicinity of Canton are obtained from the tea of bohe, or black tea. And really, when we give the subject our unprejudiced consideration, there seems nothing surprising in this state of things. Moreover, we must bear in mind that our former opinions were formed upon statements made to us by the Chinese at Canton who will say anything which suits their purpose and rarely give themselves any trouble to ascertain whether the information they communicate to be true or false. The soil of the tea districts is, of course, much richer in the northern provinces than it is in Guangdong. In Fujian and Zhejiang, it is rich, sandy loam. Tea shrubs will not succeed well unless they have a rich soil to grow in. The continual gathering of their leaves is very detrimental to their health, and, in fact, ultimately kills them. Hence, the principal object with the grower is to keep his bushes in as robust health as possible, and this cannot be done if the soil is poor. The tea plantations in the north of China are always situated on the lower and most fertile sides of the hills, and never on the lowlands. 
The shrubs are planted in rows about four feet apart and about the same distance between each row and look, at a distance, like little shrubberies of evergreens. The farms are small, each consisting of from one to four or five acres. Indeed, every cottager has his own little tea garden, the produce of which supplies the wants of his family and the surplus brings him in a few dollars, which are spent on the other necessaries of life. The same system is practiced in everything relating to Chinese agriculture. The cotton, silk, and rice farms are generally all small and managed upon the same plan. There are a few sights more pleasing than a Chinese family in the interior engaged in gathering the tea leaves, or indeed in any of their agricultural pursuits. There is the old man, it may be the grandfather or even the great-grandfather, patriarch-like, directing his descendants, many of whom are in their youth and prime, while others are in their childhood, in the labors of the field. He stands in the midst of them, bowed down with age. But to the honor of the Chinese as a nation, he is always looked up to by all with pride and affection, and his old age and gray hairs are honored, revered, and loved. When, after the labors of the day are over, they return to their humble and happy homes, their fare consists chiefly of rice, fish, and vegetables, which they enjoy with great zest and are happy and contented. I really believe there is no country in the world where the agricultural population are better off than they are in the north of China. Labor with them is pleasure, for its fruits are eaten by themselves, and the rod of the oppressor is unfelt and unknown. In the green tea districts of Zhejiang near Ningbo, the first crop of leaves is generally gathered about the middle of April. This consists of the young leaf buds, just as they begin to unfold and form a fine and delicate kind of young hyson, which is held in high estimation by the natives and is generally sent about in small quantities as presents to their friends. It is a scarce and expensive article, and the picking of the leaves in such a young state does considerable injury to the tea plantations. The summer rains, however, which fall copiously about this season, moisten the earth and air, and if the plants are young and vigorous, they soon push out fresh leaves. In a fortnight or three weeks from the time of first picking, or about the beginning of May, the shrubs are again covered with fresh leaves and are ready for the second gathering, which is, in fact, the most important of the season. The third and last gathering, which takes place as soon as the new leaves are formed, produces a very inferior kind of tea, which I believe is rarely sent out of the district. The mode of gathering and preparing the leaves of the tea plants is extremely simple. We have been so long accustomed to magnify and mystify everything relating to the Chinese that, in all their arts and manufactures, we expect to find some peculiar and out-of-the-way practice, when the fact is that many operations in China are more simple in their character than in most other parts of the world. To rightly understand the process of rolling and drying the leaves, which I'm about to describe, it must be borne in mind that the grand object is to expel the moisture and at the same time to retain, as much as possible, of the aromatic and other desirable secretions of the species. The system adopted to attain this end is as simple as it is efficacious. In the harvest seasons, the natives are seen in little family groups on the side of every hill when the weather is dry, engaged in gathering the tea leaves. They do not seem so particular as I imagine they would have been in this operation, but strip the leaves off rapidly and promiscuously and throw them all into round baskets made for the purpose out of split bamboo or rattan. In the beginning of May, when the principal gathering takes place, the young seed vessels are about as large as peas. These are also stripped off and dried with the leaves. It is these seed vessels which we often see in our tea and which have some slight resemblance to young capers. When a sufficient quantity of leaves are gathered, they are carried home to the cottage or barn where the operation of drying is performed. The Chinese cottages amongst the tea hills are simple and rude in their construction and remind one of what we used to see in Scotland in former years when the cow and pig lived and fed in the same house with the peasant. Scottish cottages, however, even in these days, were always better furnished and more comfortable than those of the Chinese at the present time. Nevertheless, it is in these poor cottages that a large proportion of the teas with their high-sounding names are first prepared. Barns, sheds, and other outhouses are also frequently used for the same purpose, particularly about the temples and monasteries. 
The drying pans and furnaces in these places are very simply constructed. The pans, which are of iron and are made as thin as possible, are round and shallow and, in fact, are the same or nearly the same which the natives have in general use for cooking their rice. A row of these are built into brickwork and chunam, having a flue constructed below them with the grating, or rather fireplace, at one end and the chimney, or at least some hole to allow the smoke to escape, at the other. The quantity of leaves from a sieve or basket are now thrown into the pans and turned over, shaken up, and kept in motion by men and women stationed there for this purpose. The leaves are immediately affected by the heat. They begin to crack and become quite moist with the vapor or sap which they give out on the application of the heat. This part of the process lasts about five minutes, in which time the leaves lose their crispness and become soft and pliable. They are then taken out of the pans and thrown upon a table, the upper part which is made of split pieces of bamboo. Three or four persons now surround the table, and the heap of tea leaves is divided into as many parcels, each individual taking as many as he can hold in his hands, and the rolling process commences. I cannot give a better idea of this operation than by comparing it to a baker working and rolling his dough. Both hands are used in the very same way, the object being to express the sap and moisture, and at the same time to twist the leaves. Two or three times during the operation, the little bundles of rolled leaves are held up and shaken out upon the table, and are then again taken up and pressed and rolled as before. This part of the process also lasts about five minutes, during which time a large portion of green juice has been expressed, and may be seen finding its way down between the interstices of the bamboos. The leaves, being now pressed, twisted, and curled, do not occupy a quarter of the space which they did before the operation. When the rolling process is completed, the leaves are removed from the table and shaken out for the last time, thinly, upon a large sort of screen, also made out of split pieces of bamboo, and are exposed to the action of the air. The best days for this purpose are those which are dry and cloudy, with very little sun, the object being to expel the moisture in the most gentle manner, and at the same time to allow the leaves to remain as soft and pliable as possible. When the sun is clear and powerful, the moisture evaporates too rapidly, and the leaves are left crisp, coarse, and not in a proper state to undergo the remaining part of the process. There is no stated time for this exposure, as much depends upon the nature of the weather and the convenience of the workpeople. Sometimes I have seen them go on with the remaining part of the operation without at all exposing the leaves to the air. Having in this manner got rid of a certain part of the superfluous moisture, the leaves, which are now soft and pliant, are again thrown into the drying pans, and the second heating commences. Again, one individual takes his post at the furnace and keeps up a slow and steady fire. Others resume their places at the different drying pans, one at each, and commence stirring and throwing up the leaves so that they must all have an equal share of the fire and none get scorched or burned. The process of drying thus goes on slowly and regularly. This part of the operation soon becomes more easy, for the leaves, as they part with their moisture, twist and curl, and consequently take up much less room than they do at first, and mix together more readily. The tea leaves being now rather too hot for the hand, a small and neat brush, made of bamboo, is used instead of the fingers for stirring them up from the bottom of the pan. During this operation, the men and women who are employed never leave their respective stations. One keeps slowly feeding the fire, and the others continually stirring the leaves. No very exact degree of temperature is attempted to be kept up, for they do not use the thermometer. But a slow and steady fire is quite sufficient. That is, the pan is made and kept so hot that I could not place my hand upon it for a second of time. In order to get a correct idea of the time required to complete this second part of the process, I referred to my watch on different occasions and at different tea farms, and always found that it occupied about an hour, that is, from the time the leaves were put into the pan, after exposure to the air, until they were perfectly dry. When the operation of drying is going on, largely, some of the pans in the range are used for finishing the process, while others, and the hottest ones, are heating and moistening the leaves before they are squeezed and rolled. Thus, a considerable number of hands can be employed at once, and the work goes on rapidly without loss of time or heat, the latter of which is of some importance in a country so ill-provided with fuel. 
The tea prepared in the manner which I have just described is greenish in color and of a most excellent quality. It is called by the Chinese in the province of Zhejiang, Chaoqing, or the tea which is dried in the pan to distinguish it from the Hongqing, or that kind which is dried in flat bamboo baskets over a slow fire of charcoal. This latter kind, the Hongqing, is prepared in the following manner. The first process, up to the period of rolling and exposure to the air, is exactly the same as that which I have just described. But instead of being put into the drying pan for the second heating, like the Chaoqing, the Hongqing is taken out into flat baskets, which are placed over tubs containing charcoal and ashes. The charcoal, when ignited, burns slowly and sends out a mild and gentle heat. Indeed, the only difference between the two teas consists in the mode of firing, the latter being dried less and more slowly than the former. The Hongqing is not so green in color as the Chaoqing, and I believe has rarely been exported. After the drying is completed, the tea is picked, sifted, divided into different kinds and qualities, and prepared for packing. This is a part of the operation which requires great care more especially when the tea is intended for the foreign market, as the value of the sample depends much upon the smallness and evenness of the leaf, as well as upon its other good qualities. In those districts where the teas are manufactured solely for exportation, the natives are very particular in the rolling process, and hence the teas from these districts are better divided and more even, although I should doubt their being really better in quality than they are in the eastern parts of the province of Zhejiang. I have stated that the plants grown in the district of Zhejiang produce green teas, but it must not be supposed that they are the green teas which are exported to England. The leaf has a much more natural color and has little or none of what we call the beautiful bloom upon it, which is so much admired in Europe and America. There is now no doubt that all these blooming green teas which are manufactured at Canton are dyed with Prussian blue and gypsum to suit the taste of the foreign barbarians. Indeed, the process may be seen any day during the season by those who will give themselves the trouble to seek after it. It is very likely that the same ingredients are also used in dyeing the northern green teas for the foreign market. Of this, however, I am not quite certain. The Chinese never use these dyed teas themselves, and I certainly think their taste in this respect is more correct than ours. It is not to be supposed that the dye used can produce any very bad effects upon the consumer, for had this been the case, it would have been discovered before now. But if entirely harmless or inert, its being so must be ascribed to the very small quantity which is employed in the manufacture. When the teas are ready for sale, the large tea merchants, or their servants, come out from the principal towns of the district and take up their quarters in all the little inns or eating houses, which are very numerous in every part of the country. They also bring coolies loaded with the copper coin of the country, which they pay for their purchases. As soon as the merchants are known to have arrived in the district, the tea growers bring their produce for inspection and sale. These little farmers or their laborers may now be seen hastening along the different roads, each with two baskets or chests slung over his shoulder on his bamboo pole. When they arrive at the merchant's abiding place, the baskets are opened before him and the quality of the tea inspected. If he is pleased with its appearance and smell, and the parties agree as to the price, the tea is weighed, the money paid down, and the grower gets his strings of copper money slung over his shoulder and returns to his farm. But should the price offered appear too low, the baskets are immediately shouldered with the greatest apparent independence and carried away to some opposition merchant. It, however, sometimes happens that a merchant makes a contract with some of the tea growers before the season commences, in which case the price is arranged in the usual way and generally a part paid in advance. This, I understand, is frequently the case at Canton when a foreign resident wishes to secure any particular kind of tea. After the teas are bought up in the district where they are grown, they are conveyed to the most convenient town where they are assorted and properly packed for the European and American markets. Such is the system of green tea culture and manufacture which came under my observation in the province of Zhejiang. The black tea districts of Fujian, which I visited, are managed in the same way as those of Zhejiang. I have already said that the species of plant which produces the black teas near Fuzhou is the very same as that found in the green tea districts of the north. 
Being further south and, of course, in a hotter climate, the tea plant of Fujian is generally grown at a high elevation amongst the hills. At the risk of some little repetition, I will insert an account of my visit to the tea hills of Fujian. Every cottager or small farmer has two or three patches of tea shrubs growing on the hillsides, which are generally planted and kept in order by the members of his own family. When the gathering season arrives, the cottage doors are locked, and all proceed to the hills with their baskets and commence plucking the leaves. This business, of course, only goes on during fine days when the leaves are dry. The first gathering takes place just when the leaf buds begin to unfold themselves in early spring. The tea is scarce and of a very superior quality, being, in fact, the same or nearly the same as that which is made from the young leaves in the green tea district. The second gathering produces the principal crop of the season. The third crop is coarse and inferior. When the leaves are brought home from the hills, they are first of all emptied out into large, flat bamboo sieves, and providing the day is not too bright, are exposed in the open air to dry off any superfluous moisture. When their moisture has evaporated, convenient portions of the leaves are brought in and thrown into a round, flat iron pan, such as the Chinese use for boiling their rice and are exposed to the heat of a gentle fire which is lighted below them. As soon as this heat reaches them, they give out a large quantity of moisture with a crackling noise, and they soon become soft and pliant. The person who attends to them stirs them about with his hands and in about five minutes takes them out and puts in a fresh supply. The heated leaves are emptied out on a large, round, and flat bamboo sieve, which is placed upon a table at a convenient height from the ground, and the process of rolling commences. Three or four persons take a portion of the heated leaves and begin to squeeze and roll them in the manner which I have already described. This goes on for a minute or two, when each person takes his portion and examines the effects which have already been produced. It is then shaken well out upon the table, after which it is gathered up and the operation of rolling and squeezing goes on as before. This is repeated three or four times, and then the whole is shaken well out on another large flat bamboo sieve in such a manner as to spread it thinly upon it. Up to this stage of the process, all the leaves have been subjected to the same treatment, but the tea in this district is now divided into two classes, each of which is treated in a peculiar manner. They are called in the language of the district Liu Cha and Hong Cha. The former seems to be a kind of mixture of black and green, and I should imagine it is only made for the use of the natives themselves. The latter is our common black tea. The Liu Cha is prepared in the following manner. The leaves, after being rolled and squeezed, are shaken out thinly and exposed to the air to dry. Great care is taken not to expose them in this state to much bright sunshine, and hence a fine, dry day when the sun is partially obscured by thin clouds is always preferred for this part of the operation. After being exposed for an hour or two, or even longer as the case may be, for this depends upon a variety of circumstances, such as the dryness of the air or the convenience of the work people, they are brought within doors and the drying process commences. The flat rice pan in which they were first heated is so constructed that it can be taken out at the pleasure of the cottager. It is now removed, and a bamboo sieve, exactly the same size, is put into its place and filled with the leaves. A very slow and steady fire of wood or charcoal is now kept up, and the remains of the moisture in the leaves is thus gradually and slowly evaporated. After a few minutes, the sieve is lifted out and placed in one of a larger size with a closer bottom. The leaves are then well shaken up and turned over, and any of the smaller tea which falls through the open sieve during the operation is thus collected in the under one and carefully saved. Both sieves are now placed over the flue, and the leaves carefully watched and turned frequently for about an hour, when the tea is considered properly fired. Sometimes, if the day is fine, it is exposed a little while to the sun before it is packed away. The hong cha, or our common black tea, is prepared rather differently. In the first place, the natives seem more particular in the rolling process, especially when it is for the foreign market, although the operation is performed much in the same way. After heating and rolling, the leaves are shaken out on large screens and subjected to the action of the open air. The natives in this, as in all other cases, taking care not to expose them to a bright and burning sun. 
This is the most important part of the manufacture. The black tea is left in this state sometimes for two or three days before it is fired, which doubtless is one cause why the color of this tea is so much darker than those teas which are prepared from the same plants and quickly dried. After being exposed for a sufficient length of time to the action of the air, the leaves are taken in for the purpose of firing. Instead, however, of being heated in baskets like the other kind, this is thrown at once into the pan. An old and experienced person takes his place at the furnace and keeps up a slow and steady fire, while it is the duty of the younger branches of the family to keep the leaves in the pan in continual motion and prevent them from being burned. This is done by means of little hand brushes made from the prolific bamboo, the outer flinty part being split for this purpose. The tea prepared in this manner soon becomes of a dark color and is quite different in appearance from the liu cha. After it has been sufficiently dried, it has, of course, to undergo the other operations of sifting, picking, and dividing before it is fit to be packed up for the foreign market. From hence, it appears that the black tea is rendered darker in color, first by being longer exposed to the air in a soft and moist state, and secondly, by being subjected to a greater degree of fire heat. With regard to the green teas, there could be no doubt that those used by the Chinese themselves are of the genuine color which they acquired in the drying, and that those blooming kinds, prepared to suit our depraved tastes, are one and all dyed. Moreover, in conclusion, I may repeat what I have already proved, that the black and green teas of the north are produced from the same species, the tea of Eridus, and that the true Canton teas are manufactured from the leaves of the tea of Bohe. It therefore follows that the black teas can be, and in fact are, made from both species, and with regard to the green, as it is the result of a dye, the Chinese, I doubt not, could substitute for that color either red or yellow, should our tastes change and lead us to prefer more glaring tints. There are several different kinds of scented flowers which are grown in particular districts for the purpose of mixing with and perfuming the tea. The city of Suzhou, in its general features, is much the same as the other cities in the north, but is evidently the seat of luxury and wealth, and has none of those signs of dilapidation and decay which one sees in such towns as Ningbo. A noble canal, as wide as the River Thames at Richmond, runs parallel with the city walls, and acts as a moat as well as for commercial purposes. This same canal is carried through arches into the city, where it ramifies in all directions sometimes narrow and dirty, and at other places expanding into lakes of considerable beauty, thus enabling the inhabitants to convey their merchandise to their houses from the most distant parts of the country. Junks and boats of all sizes are plying on this wide and beautiful canal, and the whole place has a cheerful and flourishing aspect, which one does not so often see in the other towns in China, if we accept Canton and Shanghai. The walls and ramparts are high and in excellent repair, having considerable resemblance to those of Ningbo, but in much better order. The east wall, along the side of which I went all the way, is not more than a mile in length, but the north and south are much longer, thus making the city a parallelogram. That part of the city near the east gate, by which I entered, is anything but splendid. The streets are narrow and dirty, and the population seems of the lowest order. But towards the west, the buildings and streets are much finer, the shops are large, and everything denotes this to be the rich and aristocratic part of the town. The city gates seem to be well guarded with Chinese soldiers, and all the streets and lanes inside are intersected at intervals with gates, which are closed at 9 or 10 o'clock at night. The governor general of the province resides here and keeps those under his control in excellent order. The ladies here are considered by the Chinese to be the most beautiful in the country and judging from the specimens which I had an opportunity of seeing, they certainly deserve their high character. Their dresses are of the richest material, made in a style at once graceful and elegant, and the only faults I could find with them were their small, deformed feet, and the mode they have of painting or whitening their faces with a kind of powder made for this purpose. But what seemed faults in my eyes are beauties in those of a Chinaman, and hence the prevalence of these customs." Suzhou seems to be the great emporium of the central provinces of China, for which it is peculiarly well fitted by its situation. 
The trade of Ningbo, Hangzhou, Shanghai, and many other towns on the south, Jingjiang, Nanking, and even Peking itself on the north, all centers here, and all these places are connected either by the Grand Canal or by the hundreds of canals of lesser note, which ramify over all this part of the empire. Shanghai, from its favorable position as regards Suzhou, will doubtless become one day a place of vast importance in a commercial point of view, both as regards Europe and America. I remained for several days in this city and its neighborhood when, having done all that was possible under the circumstances, I set out on my way back to Shanghai. When I arrived, I was obliged to go on shore in my Chinese dress, as the English one had been stolen by my midnight visitor. The disguise, however, was so complete that I was not recognized by a single individual, although I walked up the street where I was well known, and even my friend, Mr. Mackenzie, with whom I was staying, did not know me for the first few minutes after I sat down in his room. In the town of Shanghai, as well as in many other large Chinese towns, there are a number of public hot water bathing establishments, which must be of great importance as regards the health and comfort of the natives. I will describe one, which I pass daily during my residence in Shanghai. There are two outer rooms used for undressing and dressing. The first and largest is for the poorer classes. The second, for those who consider themselves more respectable and who wish to be more private. As you enter the largest of these rooms, a placard, which is hung near the door, informs you what the charges are, and a man stands there to receive the money on entrance. Arranged in rows down the middle and round the sides of both rooms are a number of small boxes, or lockers, furnished with lock and key, into which the visitors put their clothes and where they can make sure of finding them when they return from the bathing room, which is entered by a small door at the farther end of the building, and is about 30 feet long and 20 feet wide the water occupying the whole space except a narrow path around the sides. The water is from 1 foot to 18 inches deep, and the sides of the bath are lined with marble slabs from which the bathers step into the water and on which they sit and wash themselves. The furnace is placed on the outside, and the flues are carried below the center of the bath. In the afternoon and evening, this establishment is crowded with visitors, and on entering the bathroom, the first impression is almost insupportable. The hot steam or vapor meets you at the door, filling the eyes and ears and causing perspiration to run from every pore of the body. It almost darkens the place, and the Chinamen seen in this imperfect light, with their brown skins and long tails sporting amongst the water, render the scene a most ludicrous one to an Englishman. Those visitors who use the common room pay only six copper cash. The others pay eighteen but they have, in addition, a cup of tea and a pipe of tobacco from the proprietors. I may mention that 100 copper cash amount to about 4.5D of our money, so that the first class enjoy a hot water bath for about one farthing, and the other a bath, a private room, a cup of tea, and a pipe of tobacco for something less than one penny. When I finished my business in Shanghai, I left that city and sailed for Fuzhou on the River Min. Fuzhou is the capital of the province of Fujian, near the celebrated Bohei Hills, at about halfway between Zhou Shan and Canton. On approaching the entrance to the Min, we anchored under the lee of some islands named the White Dogs, for the purpose of procuring a fisherman who could pilot the vessel into the river, as the entrance is rather difficult for a stranger, having been until very lately but imperfectly surveyed. Going to the shore for that purpose in the ship's boat, we found a small fishing village inhabited by men and boys, most of whom had a piratical and forbidding appearance. It seems that these people only come here at certain periods of the year to fish, and when the season is past, they move to more comfortable quarters on the mainland. No women are ever allowed to inhabit the island. Having picked out the most weather-beaten man we could find, we asked him if he knew the passage to the Min, and if he could take a vessel in which drew three fathoms of water. He immediately answered in the affirmative. But when we wanted him to come on board, he altered his mind and hesitated, probably because he had not confidence in us, or, it might be, he was frightened at the consequences, not knowing how his conduct would be viewed by the authorities. Mr. Shaw, Captain Freeman, and myself now held a conference as to what was to be done. A ship and a valuable cargo were at stake. The numerous and dangerous sandbanks near the mouth of the river were visible, and as the man only refused us his service through fear and ignorance, we concluded that, as necessity has no law, there could be no great harm in taking him against his will. We accordingly pulled alongside his little junk and took him off to the ship, where he very soon got over all his fears. 
The Chinese are certainly a strange and unaccountable race. Never in my life did I witness greater apathy than was shown by this boat's crew when we took them off to the ship. Their companions, too, for there were several boats in the little bay, scarcely even looked at us or manifested the least surprise when they saw our men board the boat, get her anchor up, and hoist her sail. The next morning, our pilot got the ship under way and took us into the river Min by a passage not marked in our charts. He evinced the most perfect acquaintance with the depth of water at every part and at last anchored us in safety abreast of a small temple a few miles from the mouth of the river. Before we came to the most dangerous point, where we had to pass between two sandbanks, the captain very quietly informed him that if he made any mistake and got the ship aground, he should have his tail cut off, a punishment very nearly the greatest which can be inflicted on a Chinaman. When told, he shrugged up his shoulders, gave a sly look, and said, Very well, we shall see by and by. The anchorage being reached in safety, the old man thought it was now his time for a joke, and, turning triumphantly around, with his tail in one of his hands, exclaimed, Now, what about the tail? Is it to be cut off or not? Or are you satisfied? The passage by which we entered the river is called by the natives the Wuhu Mun, or the Five Tiger Gate. And here we saw a most singular rock, or island, which is cleft, as it were, into five pyramids, and is much revered by the Chinese sailor. In fact, he seems to look upon it as representing the gods of the ocean, and he fails not to offer up his thanks and his offerings every time he passes by it on returning from sea. The Chinese are often taunted with their indifference to the religion which they profess, and yet the earnest and devout manner in which they burn incense and worship at their holy places would put to the blush many of the professors of a holier and purer faith. The scenery at the mouth of the Min and towards Fuzhou is striking and beautiful. The river itself varies much in width and depth, according to the district through which it flows. Near its mouth, and at some parts where the country between it and the hills is flat, it is not less than a mile in width, but at other parts, where the mountains come almost to the water's edge, the river is narrow, deep, and rapid. There are two or three such places between the mouth of the Min and the city of Fuzhou. The whole of this district is hilly, many of the mountains being at least 3,000 feet high. And at this season of the year, when thunderstorms were almost of daily occurrence, the effects produced by them amongst these mountains were grand and sublime. It is evident that the Chinese greatly dreaded our visiting this place during the war. I observed that forts had been built on all the most commanding positions on the sides of the river, but most of them were now without guns and had already become dilapidated. The little town and fortress of Mingan, a few miles up the river, is beautifully situated on a hill sloping down to the water, and the position is so strong by nature that, if manned with English troops, it could defend the pass against the strongest force. A few miles below the city, the river is blocked up, almost all the way across, with stones and old junks which are covered at high water. I believe the intended plan of defense was to wreck all our vessels on this barrier and destroy our men by batteries erected near it. On the banks of the river are numerous temples or joss houses built in the most romantic and beautiful situations. About nine miles below Fuzhou, a pretty little pagoda stands on an island on the left bank of the river. Near this is the anchorage for large vessels, which it would not be prudent to take up to the town. The city and suburbs of Fuzhou stand in an opening amongst the hills, about 20 miles from the mouth of the Min. The river runs through the suburbs, which are connected by the celebrated bridge called the Wanshou, or Myriads of Ages, which was always said to consist of 100 arches. It is not an arched bridge at all, but it is nevertheless a wonderful structure, being about 2,000 feet in length and having 50 strong pillars of stone with large slabs of granite reaching from the one to the other and forming the top of the bridge. During the rains, the river rushes through these divisions with awful rapidity, and as the bridge has evidently stood for many ages, it is a proof of the substantial manner in which it was originally built. Leaving the ship at the mouth of the Min, Mr. Shaw, Captain Freeman, and myself started in a native boat to go up to the city. When we were getting into the boat, our old friend the pilot, who by this time had become quite at home amongst us, came and begged us to give him a passage as far up as the first town we were to pass on the way. We inquired why he did not go back again to his fishing at the White Dog Island. His reply was, I should get robbed by pirates of all the money you have given me for pilotage. I must first make sure of it by depositing it in the hands of a friend of mine in the town. 
After that is done, I shall return to the island. We were nearly two days in getting up to the city, owing to the rapidity of the stream caused by the late heavy rains. We landed near the bridge already noticed, and immediately inquired for the house of the English consul, who, we were informed, lived in a temple situated within the city, and about three miles from the landing place. As nearly the whole of the streets in the suburbs were under water at the time, in some parts the depth of four feet, it was impossible to walk this distance. As nearly the whole of the streets in the suburbs were under water at this time, in some parts the depth of four feet, it was impossible to walk this distance, nor was it necessary to make the attempt, for chairmen surrounded us in great numbers, and were as determined on putting us into their chairs as a London conductor is to have passengers for his omnibus. We willingly yielded to their solicitations and got into chairs and set off for the consular residence. The people here had seen but few foreigners and were particularly impertinent and annoying. Hundreds followed us and crowded round the chairs. Kwang Yanga, Kwang Yanga, their term for foreigners, was ringing in our ears from all sides and frequently other appellations of much worse signification. Our Chinese servants, who walked by our side, were attacked and reviled for having any connection with us. In one of the streets, the water was so deep that I was obliged to stand up on the seat of the chair, and even then it breached my feet. Here the crowd became very abusive and commenced throwing water over us. At first our servants bore this treatment pretty well, but their patience was at last exhausted, and they turned upon the assailants. The scene was now both amusing and disagreeable. Luckily, I happened to be a little in advance and was therefore pretty well out of the melee, but Captain Freeman came in for his full share of it and was completely soaked through. When we got within the city walls, we were not molested further, owing, I suppose, to the greater strength of the police. The city is walled and fortified upon the same plan as Ningbo and Shanghai and is at least eight or nine miles in circumference, having, as usual, east, west, north, and south gates. At various points on the walls, as well as above the gates, guard houses are erected, each containing guns, some of which, according to the writings on them, were cast about the commencement of the last war. A small area between the south and north gates is not built upon, but the greater part of the space within the walls is densely covered with houses. There are two rather handsome pagodas and some small hills on which temples are built, and where a good view of the town and suburbs may be obtained. On one of these hills, the British consul has his residence. The streets in all Chinese cities have much the same appearance. Some are a little wider than others and have better and more attractive shops, but by far the greater part of them are narrow and dirty, and Fuzhou certainly forms no exception to the general rule. A large trade appears to be carried on here in copper, judging from the number of shops filled with manufactured articles of that metal, particularly of gongs, of which I observed an immense number of all sizes. A great quantity of iron is manufactured here, and wire drawing is carried on extensively. The great export trade of the port, however, is in wood, which is floated down the mean in large quantities and covers many acres in the suburbs near the riverside. Hundreds of junks from Xiamen, Ningbo, Japu, and some even from as far north as the province of Shandong are constantly employed in this trade. The wood is chiefly a sort of common pine employed in the building of houses, and it is generally cut into lengths suited to that purpose before it is shipped. Good planks of fine hard wood can also be had in any quantity at this place. The wood junks are loaded with great skill, a great part of their cargo being lashed to their sides, thus making them about three times their ordinary width. Banking is carried on to a greater extent in Fuzhou than in the other towns which I have visited. Paper notes are a common medium of exchange, in which the people have the greatest confidence, preferring them to dollars or cash. Some of the notes are as low as 400 cash, about 18 pence English money. Others are for very large sums. The people here are generally much cleaner in their habits and appear to be a more active race than those in the northern towns. In fact, they approach more nearly to the natives of Canton than to any other in these respects. I was much surprised to find them consuming beef and even milk in considerable quantities, articles which are never used by the inhabitants of the other districts where I have been. Indeed, everywhere else, the Chinese were wont to express their astonishment when they saw the English using such articles of food. The ladies of Fuzhou are particularly fond of flowers, artificial as well as natural, for the decoration of their hair. 
the rustic cottage beauty employs the more large and gaudy, such as the red hibiscus, while the refined damsels prefer the jasmine, tuberose, and others of that description. Artificial flowers, however, are more in use than natural ones. The population of Fuzhou has been estimated at about half a million, and I have no doubt that if the suburbs and numerous villages in the vicinity be taken into account, the number is not overstated. Up to the time when I left China, little or nothing had been done here in the way of trade, and I cannot help thinking that its advantages in this respect have been greatly overrated. It is never likely to be a place of as great importance to England as the more northerly port of Shanghai, and for this very simple reason, the physical nature of the country is against it. The whole of the surrounding region is mountainous. The rivers are rapid, and in some places shallow, and are often liable to rain floods. There are consequently many impediments in the way of a free transmission of goods into the interior of the country. Fuzhou was supposed to possess great advantages owing to its being near the Bohe or Black Tea District, and it was thought at one time that it might form the great emporium for the export of this article to Europe and America. This opinion, however, has hitherto proved fallacious, and I believe it is now ascertained that the black teas can be brought more readily to Shanghai or Ningbo than to Fuzhou, especially since the Bohe teas have sunk in estimation, and other districts to the northward, having taken the place of the Bohe Hills, are now furnishing the black teas of commerce. In addition to all these disadvantages, the natives seem a lawless and turbulent race, having all the characteristics of those in the Canton province, and like them being inveterate in their hatred of foreigners, and full of conceit as to their own importance and power. Several very serious disturbances have taken place at the port since it was opened to the British. After paying our visit to the English consul, we returned to the suburbs to look out for a house where we could put up during our stay. When we got back to the river, we found all our luggage and servants already safely lodged in the house of a person who had been ordered by the mandarins to lodge us and look after us. We were glad to get indoors from the insulting crowd, and were consequently not very particular as to quarters. We soon found, however, that we were very strictly watched, and that we could not move anywhere without the fact being communicated to the mandarins. Well, that is our China Vintage Hour passage for today. Not a bad one. I hope you are all now properly educated on the finer points of growing, processing, and packaging tea. In Fortune's next two books, which we'll get to at another time, he actually returns to China on a secret mission for the British East India Company to get a much closer look at tea, snip some cuttings, and, and steal as many seeds as he could carry away surreptitiously and forward everything to India. I hope Fortune's blow-by-blow -blow explanation wasn't too overpowering regarding the fine points of manufacturing tea. If you didn't know it already, I guess this gives you a nice appreciation of how laborious the process is. Later on, someone at the Honorable British East India Company will read this book, Three Years' Wanderings in the Northern Provinces of China. And after learning of Fortune's expertise and reputation, it will lead directly to his next mission. When he goes back on his next China trip, he will carry out one of the great acts of international espionage, and he'll get away with it, too. So we have more Robert Fortune next time, and maybe after I wring his next book dry of the best passages, we'll move on to someone else and a different part of China. So please come back again next time for maybe an episode or two more of our favorite condescending imperialist British friend. Hey, he had quite an adventure. It's hard enough in 2017 to do some of the things he did, let alone in the days right after the Opium War. This is Laszlo Montgomery bidding you a fond farewell. We're coming to you always, or almost always, from the drought-stricken city of Los Angeles, California. We're coming to you, of course, from Teacup Media. Man, they got some fantastic shows on that channel. China History Podcast, Chinese Sayings Podcast, and so much more to come. Go check them all out. And, of course, do consider joining me next time, perhaps, for another enjoyable and relaxing edition of the China Vintage Hour.